All right, I can't resist telling you a couple of uh, uh, anecdotes about Locke uh, as, a, as a philosopher of realism and as a philosopher of education uh, about him personally that I think uh, uh, underscore both of those points. But I want to put some things on the board here. So the uh, first thing is that Locke mentioned uh, in the passage I, I read in closing, or no, second in closing, that he had read some systems of physics and he didn't find them very encouraging. One of the things that's relevant here is that Locke, when he uh, went off to college at Oxford, uh, did not train uh, to be a philosopher. He always wanted to be a philosopher, but uh, then, as now, it's very hard to make a living as a philosopher, and so he had to make a choice about something that he thought would be more likely uh, to enable him to, uh, to make a living. And at that point, one could major in theology at Oxford, or one could major in the law, or one could get a degree in, uh, in medicine. He wasn't particularly interested in pursuing uh, theology. He was aware of uh, the, the, the religious upheaval of the century, uh, uh, and it had come to England. He was not very impressed with that. In his religious views, Locke was much more uh, big tent or, or latitudinarian in his approach, not uh, uh, in his uh, judgment, you know, hung up on, on uh, the uh, particular right, uh, version of, of Christian doctrine per se. He also didn't want to be a lawyer, uh, and so he decided to, to be a, a medical doctor, and so he got the best kind of medical training that uh, Oxford could offer at the time. But uh, uh, the point then is that uh, one of the things that he learned right, while he was getting his medical education are certain uh, systems of physics and certain systems of medical chemistry right at that point. And I want to just give you one example of what Locke would have learned to, uh, to illustrate the point of why he was not very impressed with the state of, of much of the science at that time. Now at that time, uh, medical doctors knew that if you, for example, had a student who had anemia, or not a student, a patient who had, who had anemia, uh, that if you gave that person iron salts, then the iron salts would cure the anemia. And this was good practical medical knowledge that, right, that one had, uh, and uh, it had been tested quite a lot, and so there's a good track record here. So at the empirical level, uh, this is something then that everybody knows and it becomes standard pra practice uh, for, for, for doctors and for, for those doctors in training. But where there was a big black hole of knowledge, so to speak, is understanding why iron salts cured anemia. Uh, what is it about anemia? What is it about iron salts such that they, uh, they have this natural uh, relationship here that's a positive relationship. And so here's the uh, uh, one of the extant theories of the time uh, coming out of a school of thought called uh, I, uh, the uh, iatrochemistry. Uh, and the reasoning was something like the following. We say, well, what do we know about anemia? And then the prevailing theory at the time is that, well, anemia is a matter of having weak blood. Okay. Uh, what do we know about iron? Well, we know that iron is strong. All right, now we're making some progress. Uh, we have weakness over here, and we have strength over here. But how exactly does the strength over here uh, communicate itself to the weakness over here? What's the causal mechanism, right, so to speak, that we're, we're trying to figure out here as scientists? Well, what else uh, do we know? Well, we know that blood is red. Uh, technically not true. Blood is not red until it's oxygenated. But uh, this is the 17th century. Uh, and we're kind of reaching a dead end here. So let's go and work on this side of the equation a little bit more here. Uh, iron is strong, and so we could say iron then is uh, used in war. Because it's so strong, we uh, use it for making our, our weapons and our shields, right, and so forth. Okay, and we also know that, uh, you'll like this part, Mars is the god of war. And we're almost done because Mars is also the red planet. And bingo. Although this was before bingo was invented, blood is red, Mars is the red planet. So we now have a theoretical causal mechanism. The strength of iron right, is communicated through Mars, the god of war, astrologically and then astronomically, right, through the red planet, and it's the color, right, of blood that is then the causal mechanism communicating the strength to the weak blood, thereby strengthening it and curing 
anemia. All right, now, in one sense, that's a beautiful thing, but it's also uh, ridiculous, and this is why Locke, for example, is saying if this is the prevailing understanding of the physical universe, the understanding of scientific chemistry, I'm not that impressed, and so I'm not going to include it on my curriculum, and uh, Locke then doesn't have much of a room for physics and chemistry at this time. Uh, also, uh, though, uh, I did mention that Locke did want to be a philosopher as a young man, loved those issues there, uh, ended up, uh, though, majoring in medicine because it would be a more practical uh, uh, a way to make a living for him. He did, though, fairly quickly realize his lifelong ambition of being able to be a philosopher, and it was his medical career that enabled him to do so. And here, uh, the, the fortunate thing that happened in Locke's life was that he was put in contact with the Earl of Shaftesbury. Shaftesbury was a major mover and shaker, politically speaking, in uh, late 17th century English po uh, politics. But unfortunately, uh, Shaftesbury was plagued by ulcers, just horrible ulcers that uh, took him out of commission for great stretches of time. He tried lots of physicians, lots of uh, alleged remedies, and nobody was able to do very much for him uh, in terms of his ulcers. So, uh, John Locke, then a relatively young physician, was recommended to him as an up-and-comer, and so Shaftesbury, to some extent in desperation, says, okay, I'll try this new guy. Locke comes in. And notice the cast of Locke's mind as I talk through the story here. It's very modern, very realist, very scientific, right, in his approach to medicine. What Locke does when he examines Shaftesbury is says, all right, here's the problem that we have, right? Here's the stomach. The stomach has too much acid in it. How can we then get the acid out of the stomach? Well, we could, of course, you know, induce vomiting on a fairly regular basis, but we know that that does nasty stuff to the person's throat if you vomit regularly. We could also give the person uh, laxatives on a regular basis and try that approach. Uh, that also has all sorts of nasty side effects that we don't want to get ourselves involved in. And so Locke then is saying what we then essentially have is a plumbing problem. How do we get the acid that's inside the stomach out? And so what Locke did, as he went to a metal worker, had the metal worker make a spigot, like the kind of spigot that one would attach a garden hose to, right, for example. Have it made out of uh, solid gold. A uh, Shaftesbury can afford for this to occur, gold being uh, a relatively clean metal, one that doesn't tarnish, right, it's more, more, uh, more pure and so forth. Uh, so a spigot made out of gold, it's got a couple of flanges, goes back to Shaftesbury's place, gets Shaftesbury all liquored up, lays him out on a table, drills a hole directly into the side of uh, Shaftesbury's stomach, uh, inserts the, uh, the spigot into it. One of the flanges goes on the inside of the stomach wall, the other flange on the outside of the, uh, of the stomach there, cleans it up, puts a dressing on there, and waits, and it works perfectly. Right. Shaftesbury, at that point, after he recovers from the surgery, is then able, anytime his ulcers are acting up, to step aside discreetly, excuse me for a moment here, take a little bowl, open the spigot, drain out all of the excess acids from his stomach, close up the small and discreet uh, spigot, dump out the acid, and the ulcers are at least temporarily cured for a, a while. So it's a great medical success story here. Now, uh, it's a medical success story, but notice the method that's being used here, right? We're not relying on the ancients. We're not relying on traditional methods that are being handed down. Locke is approaching this subject with an open mind. It's observation, it's experimentation, it's that modern, naturalistic, realist way, right, of approaching, approaching the subject. And of course, there's a certain amount of courage involved in uh, drilling holes into great men of one's day. It was also a great success, not only medically, but it was also a great success for Locke professionally, right, because then uh, Shaftesbury's response was to say, Locke, you're hired, you are now my family physician, you can come and live on our estates. Uh, uh, and, of course, whenever we have a medical problem in the family, you will come and attend to us. But that did leave Locke with great swaths of time for pursuing his first love, right, which is philosophy. Uh, and so he was able to think and write a great deal and then come to be known as one of the world's great philosophers of all time. All right, we'll stop there on realism uh, in theory and in general and, uh, and historically in Locke's particular case. What I want to turn next to are some of the major implications for realism as an educational practice in contemporary times.